Hello, Cyclocross friends, and thanks for tuning in to episode 333 of Cyclocross Radio. On today's show, Tyler Cloutier, pinch hitting for uh, Bodie, sitting in in the media pit to talk about everything that happened at King's CX in Ohio last weekend, and then he gives me a short recap on what's going on in European cyclocross. So it was great to catch up with Tyler and have him on the show. And we are going to get into that in just a minute, right after I tell you about Hammerhead and the crew cycling computer. I'm going to get right down to the nuts and bolts on this. It's, it's the perfect time to be outside riding right now. At least it is on the East Coast. It's beautiful. You can have any kind of any kind of ride you want. You can you can get all bundled up in the morning and go out there in the 40 degree weather. And by the afternoon, it's in the in the mid 70s and just gorgeous. No humidity. This is now the time. I don't know what you're training for, but but start training for it now. And and the best way to record all that data that you need for your training or to put your workouts in for that training you're doing for that mysterious event that you may be uh, training for uh, is is to use the Hammerhead computer. So here's the deal with that computer you know one of the best uh data points out there is heart rate we all want to have that along with our power and everything else and just it puts it all together in a nice picture to know where you are uh you can get a heart rate monitor on us at cx cx radio cyclocross radio by using the code cx radio so here's what you do you go to hammerhead.io you put in you, you put your hammer your hammerhead crew into your basket into your cart you get the heart rate monitor you also put that into the cart you go check out and then you put in the code cx radio in the little coupon code section and then it will deduct the price of that heart rate monitor from your total because that heart rate monitor it, that's coming from us that's on us you get the computer we throw in the heart rate monitor hammerhead.io put in the crew Put in a heart rate monitor, use the code CX radio, C X R A D I O, and that heart rate monitor is free. All right, make sure you check out everything going on at wideanglepodium.com. Rob Kelly continues to post about Criterium Racing. It's great stuff. Go give Criterium Nation a follow. And listen to those podcasts and, and let them know you're listening to him. Go leave a comment on his Instagram, Criterium Nation. Uh, what else can I tell you? The CX Airs Bulletin, we're still out there getting you race reports and photos and results. Would love for you to follow along, become a subscriber to the CX Airs Bulletin. You can do that at cxairs.substack.com. Follow, follow Tyler Cloutier also. If you're looking for a coach, go go talk to him. He's over at Ignition Coaching. It's episode 333, 333 of Cyclocross Radio. It's myself and Tyler Cloutier in the media pit. We're talking about King CX, and we're doing that right now. All right, we're back in the media pit. Little little different different look here. Uh, Bodie, Bodie on vacation this week, uh, and, and taking some time off, but we got Tyler Cloutier sitting in Tyler. It's been a while since we chatted. What's, uh, what's going on? Uh, well, I appreciate the call up, um, from, you know, the exact cross series of gravel to, uh, talking about a real sport like cyclocross. Again, I didn't have time to grow a, a majestic beard like Bodie, but Happy to be here anyways. And, uh, awesome. Yeah. So you've been doing a lot of podcasting, Bonk Brothers. That's still that's still going strong, yeah. Yeah, still going. Um still have enough nonsense to talk about week to week. So this uh keeps us on it. Yeah, so big uh big end of the lifetime Grand Prix. I guess that's probably the the topic that y'all are discussing these days. Oh, for sure. Yep. Lifetime Grand Prix and all that's happening, who's coming, who's going. The biggest show in town. Well, was last week. I asked this to Amanda on our last Grodio podcast. I'll ask you too. Is the Lifetime Grand Prix now a mountain biking series? <laughs> well, I think next year they only have one, what I would call actual mountain bike race in Little Sugar. 
Um, okay, but, but the but Schwamagon is supposedly a mountain bike race. Leadville is supposedly a mountain bike race. So then you're up to three. You only have six in the series. Well, and, supposedly is the key word there. Okay, you're all right. A lot of the riders will be riding mountain bikes. That's very true. Is yes. that fair? Yes, okay. that is true. All right, even if they have drop bars on them. Uh, yes. And and then so and I was like, well, and then uh, Sea Honor supposedly is a mountain bike race, but I guess maybe they were ahead of me on this because then it would have been like four to two, mm -hmm. and uh, d supposedly like Sea Otter now isn't a mountain bike race; it's a gravel race, which sort of goes to your point that I don't know that the course actually changes. <laughs> I think it's the same track they just <laughs> perhaps draws it a slightly different crowd but yeah yeah it's uh it'll be in it's always interesting to follow along with their coverage and the decisions that they make for their series and try to stir up as much drama as we can or at least cover it so you spent many years uh racing in the uci fields that we're gonna be talking about how how has it been to the transition of uh, just kind of like watching from the sidelines? And also, have you have you done any done any local cross? Uh, I did one local cross race last year. Uh, did it single speed, uh, so that was a good way to keep pressure off myself from uh, my ego and feeling like I need to perform. Also, did not have the fitness for the normal uh, P one two three race, so. Yeah, it was a good way to protect myself mentally and emotionally. Uh, but uh, it's been, I would say the first year it was nice uh, to take a step away from the full-time racing scene. Um, stayed up with, you know, uh, the media pit episodes, keeping a, a finger on the pulse of what was happening. And same for this year. But I will say, I think I'm feeling a little bit more FOMO this year, especially with the coverage that you guys have been putting out on Instagram live and then recap episodes now with YouTube. It's yeah, I'm definitely feeling a little bit of FOMO not being at the races and um, yeah, maybe yeah, might have to look in to see what 2025 looks like. If we can venture up to some races and you know, maybe I'll go the, uh, the single speed route or something like that. It seems That'd to be, be a yeah. place to retire. That's yeah. Which would be sweet. It'd be amazing. You you should you should start training now. Go to Louisville. Jump in on that Sunday single speed race. Now that they sort of you know rejiggered the whole uh, national schedule. Yeah, I think it will be nice to have a a nationals that I think people might hang around for. Right on on yeah. a Saturday, bigger crowds. Not to say that the last time I was at Louisville in twenty nineteen, it was. Uh, yeah, Nationals Part Two or twenty. Yep. I guess that was twenty eighteen. Um, it was great crowds, um, but hopefully they'll be even bigger this year. Yeah, the single speed will be uh, probably maybe a few more hand ups along the way since riders have uh, nothing to worry about the next day on Monday. Yeah, for sure. And uh, Kerry Warner is already trying to recruit everybody just to stick around on Sunday <laughs> and race that. So that'll be that'll be good. But uh, we had we had uh, King CX this past weekend. I think the last, no, not the last, next to last, C1, C2 weekend of the season. We got really rad, I guess, would be the final one coming up this weekend. Uh, but you've you've done Kings a ton. You know, I was talking about this, like, with Major Taylor, that it can be two different. This is probably everywhere. They give it dry versus if it's muddy, it completely changes the course. That's my, that's my groundbreaking, you know, um, uh, revelation of cyclocross, that it's different mm -hmm. in different conditions. But this is another one that, you know, it's it's completely different race when it's when it's wet versus versus dry. And I think the the main thing with it is it's it's two completely different kinds of slippery. You know, it's yes. super dusty this week. Yeah, the years that it's it's been muddy, I wouldn't say it's a a slog by any means. It's not that super thick mud that you might get in other parts of the country. Um not a, it's definitely not the same as a wet major tailor, I can say that from experience. But yeah, to your point, it, it is still just as slippery in the super dry, dusty conditions as it would had it rained at all. And every once in a while, you get a year that it drizzles a little bit and then it's just hero dirt by the afternoon. But it doesn't seem like you got that this year. Uh, no, it was, it was, it was beautiful out. It was like in the, you know, 
low 70s, I think, by the time that we were racing out there. The wind wasn't super bad. It was just so dry, and they hadn't had right. any rain. So by the time, you know, they had a good crowd out there. I think they had around a 1,000 racers over the weekend. So by the time that the elite races started, like, everything was just burned in. The grass was gone, and it was just just clouds of dust. So it which just made, you know, you know that course. There are lots of off, lots of like little off cambers on there mm-hmm. at speed. So that's just, you know, it, it became, uh, much more dangerous to try to make any kind of pass. Cause you get off that line and you're just like sliding out. Yeah. And I, I remember a lot of transitions too, from, you know, uh, some, uh, I'll say broad radius cambers, uh, and through corners and such that really required, they had a speed limit, I guess. I mean, were there any, and of course the it's not double trouble that's at rochester but the wood section always had some type of fairly rideable mostly run up did they make any big changes to the course this year? yeah so i wanted to talk to you about that section so yeah you're right so the, the, this is again it's it's this kind of a um front half back half although it's kind of funny because i think pit one and pit two both are in the first third of the of the course uh but that that first, you know, that long stra- starting stretch up into that big wide right hand turn is really your your only real power section of this mm-hmm. course where you can really let it go. Other than maybe some of the golf carts on the on the back side, and then after that, it's yeah, it's a lot of twisty turny stuff. And then the woods this year, so they changed it up in that that run up wasn't in play like that was that wasn't even there every day but it was like these they came in almost the reverse way for the first half of that so those whoops that you used to get at the end of that section were in the beginning and then it sort of looped around and they had this like what they call the boneyard section which is just more of kind of wooded almost double track back back in there which i don't think that part was bad but i think it was that entrance to the woods that change some change some races right or were factors in in some of the elite races so that was the real tricky spot that i think people are keeping their their eye on for sure yeah i've always i always thought in the years that i was at cincinnati that it was a really well balanced course and it wasn't the case that they would just keep the same track year after year there was always slight tweaks to it Um, charm city was another one i think even go cross is one where it's well balanced between power and skill and it's not just uh you know one of these tracks that it just tips itself totally to particular type of rider but yeah it was always a a nice balance of wide open pedaling sections and then some some speed limits on the course Uh, yeah and it seemed like the camel section this year wasn't as they almost like straightened it out a little bit um so it wasn't as as kind of tricky as it had been in the past like that final drop out of it i saw it like in amateur fields definitely saw some people like getting it wrong and going through that fence but in in the elites it was you know they weren't having any issues with it at all and really the only uh place that that came into play was the when you're coming in on the the back side of it when you first enter the camel that kind of big power up was it really looked like a place, you know, after pit two and you roll around to that, that looked like a place that people were looking to kind of maybe test, do some tests or at least, or start an attack or make some sort of move up on, onto that hill and then just stretch it out from there. Gotcha. So I would, I think it wouldn't be a, a CX hairs bulletin media pit episode. Sorry. I got the name wrong. Probably <laughs> a media pit episode. <laughs> if we didn't discuss the sprint before the sprint, which was always the second time, on the off camber of the camel and or to the barriers so was that a factor this year that kind of coming off of that towards the start finish it seemed like it got knocked back even farther into the enchanted forest part of the woods like if you led into there i think people were racing to that entrance and if you led into there and were able to sort of have a clean shot through there you could get a little bit of a gap and that seemed to be where the separations were happening otherwise so when we were watching these races from near the finish line and it's it's a great venue for this that you can really see a lot but you would see everybody pop out of the woods 
where they'd go in together and that's where you'd see like the three, four bike lengths coming out. And then after that, you know, going into the camels, you just had to maintain. Yeah. I years past thinking of, um, Kerry Werner, he Bruner, and even, I think, uh, the races last year came down to that last lap where Clara was able to, it was Clara, right. Holding on to a lead. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was always a critical section and if you slipped out in that last little off camber tiptoe across it was game over generally yeah i think it was yeah it was clara and uh isabella holmgren i think going <laughs> at it last year it was kind of funny because uh isabella was at this race so we had our uh we had our world champ there but she was um out there just hanging out and taking photos <laughs> cheering on the the rest of the holmgren crew it sounds like yeah, cheering on Gunner and the rest of the Canadians. You know, this is this is kind of week two of the uh, Canadian invasion that that we've had for for North America, um, you know, which uh, kind of brings us right into this women's race on Saturday. Um, Magalie Rochette back. You know, I, I think we had talked to her at Trek, and she had had Clausel and Ocker there, so it was a little different test for her, but not really feeling like her form was where she wanted it to be, and feeling a little, a little frustrated. It seemed like she came into this one a little bit better, and uh, was definitely the favorite going into the weekend. It was, it was just, it was, it was interesting to see who was going to try to challenge her. And mm. looking, looking at the field, like so really, you know, Major Taylor was one, and then this is sort of our second look of getting a a kind of um, exclusive North American look to the to the women's field. Um, and I think the 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 people that we were really looking at were Katie Klaus, who's been strong all season, and then also. Lizzie Gonzalez, who had a good weekend, you know, racing against Carolyn Manny up in, in Major Taylor, and then also Carolyn herself. And then, then just to see who else was going to kind of emerge from, from that field to take advantage of not having uh, Claus Allen Bacher there. Yeah, I know Mags had a, a particularly rough start to the year. It seems like she dealt with some injuries and just, like you said, lack of, lack of fitness. And looking at her results a little bit earlier, I mean, that I would bite your arm off for, you know, not finishing outside the top seven, uh, save for one DNF at Trek. But I know that, you know, there's levels to this game. And for Magali being, I'm sure, off the podium is um, is outside of the norm. Uh, but it's cool to see riders like Lauren Zerner and Katie Klaus, especially for Katie having come off, I think, an abbreviated season last year, really only racing a hand races to now starting at go-cross and, yeah, I mean, also just trending upwards uh, in the results category there. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think she's she's been pretty open about that where she came in, you know, maybe a little under train, hadn't really raced much at all. I think she did like one race in May before starting the cyclocross season and was just kind of kind of keeping a long view about it and looking to build each week. And so far, yeah, she's definitely looking stronger each time. Uh, this one, this one really it was this one came down to Katie and Rochette in the end, you know, really exciting finish. You, you were talking about the sprint before the sprint. We, we actually uh, got to see an actual sprint on this on day one for the women. So that was, that was pretty sweet between those two. And they had Lauren Zerner with them up until the last lap. Um, Gonzalez probably would have been there. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about how, this course is kind of like the, the, the power section in the front. And then, and then, um, you know, a lot of twists and turns, which really limits the ability to pass. There's really not an opportunity to get ahead in this, um, on this course and, and keep that gap, I think is, is, is the problem. Lizzie got maybe a, uh, eyes bigger than her bike, maybe on, on, <laughs> on one of these, uh, early uh, off cambers kind of kind of tried to shove her way through it didn't go very well and she went down and um uh, there was a bit bit of a pile, pile up um after Rochette and Klaus and Zerner had already gone through Manny was the other one that was able to escape from that and then everybody else kind of either had to go foot down or pick themselves up from the ground to to get starting again so that was 
that was really where our separation happened, I think was on lap three. Yeah, that it only takes one in those uh, in those single sections, especially on that camel hump and, and even back in the woods on that course. As you said, there's it, it's wide enough. It's what, 12 feet across in most sections per the, the rules and regulations from UCI overlords. But and that course can get really small in terms of the lines that you can actually ride or where the line is. Um, and yeah, when it is like that, if one person slips out and you happen to be second wheel there, it's, uh, it's hard to claw back, claw yourself back on that course. But yeah, um, yeah, I was reading the race report and Caroline still just crushing it. Um, how old is she? Did she tell you that this week or she, <laughs> <laughs> I believe she's racing age 38. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I it was it. I um I didn't get to catch up with her. She actually she did you know got that fourth place on day one and pulled out on day two after a lap. I didn't I didn't uh, check in with her to see see what was going on there. I would try to um see what happened uh, coming up at really rad. Uh, see where she's at. But uh, good good end to this one. But yeah, we were talking about Mags and just her her kind of feeling better over let's um let's uh, let's take a listen to how her day went so well we'll just start from trek you're feeling a little down on yourself there trying to figure things out Did you, seems like you figured them out i figured something out working on it uh, feeling so much better first i'm much healthier i'm starting to feel strong again which is awesome and i think mentally i've worked a lot to kind of come back to the basics you know and just make it simple and kind of refigure out how to show up to a race which has felt really good so i'm very happy and just stoked on being here yeah and it's kind of like I, I know you weren't happy with like where you were in the race last week and it seems like you've come to grips with that as maybe like later in the season but that's the starting point going forward from here yeah exactly like that is the starting point and that's okay like it's easy to be to want to be somewhere else but the truth is you are where you are and you got to start there and so i think i kind of reset like that mindset and now i'm building on that and it feels good because now like i can just do honest performance learn from it build from it build on it and just keep going looks like today you were happy just with the status quo you and katie and lauren just sort of right right around i mean at pace but no no, no one was really attacking at all mm-hmm. until sort of that first climb up into the camels on the last lap. Was was there any other plan? Was, or I tried uh, two other times, actually. So And one time it worked, but I slid out in the woods. So I was like, okay. So I, it, like, I knew that this was maybe a good place to go because it worked out. Like I got a few a few bike lanes. And you don't need much here, to be honest. Like it's hard to... I think once you open it, then you can like really open the gap. But I couldn't get that separation. Um, so in the end, I decided to wait until the last lap. And... I mean, it barely worked, but it worked. So yeah, very hard to make a to make a difference here. So I'll have to think today on how to approach it tomorrow. I mean, I think like, yeah. I mean, I can't say my secret, but I'll try something. We'll we'll, we'll learn the secret tomorrow. Yeah, see, I'll learn the secret tomorrow. Okay. But it was awesome. Like Katie was strong, and Lauren, honestly, like she's been really good. So it's fun to see that. All right, congrats. We'll see you out here tomorrow. Thanks. All right, so. Um, didn't really get much. I think I, I think when I talked to Katie, I talked more about the about the sprint coming into it. But um, yeah, kind of just just uh, recounting how her season is going. Yeah, and I I always love her honesty and the feedback and insight that she provides for us because I think sometimes in in sports in general, it's hard to get folks that have so much candor and, and just are open about how they're feeling. But Mags definitely um, definitely provides that in in spades, and I'm. I'm hopeful. I know she's generally the last couple of years come into the season really hot and been super strong um, and then get towards the end of the year. And I think she's, from my perspective, is my opinion only, it seems to be holding on to that form. Um, so I'm hopeful this year that she can, you know, kind of build into the season, like she was saying, and, and really finish off strong and, and continue to have the results that she's accustomed to, we'll say. Yeah, and, and that that has to be the Waterloo World Cup effect, right? Because all, for all of the North Americans, they're looking at you know we always talked about it being like the Daytona 500, you know the Super Bowl is at the beginning of the season that yep. that they were everybody's coming in hot. Like you want to win or at least get on a podium or have one of your best results in that home World Cup where you're able to take advantage of time zones and everybody else traveling and everything like that. It's a whole new world now this year. 
for sure for sure yeah and, and uh, it can afford someone like like Magali or like Katie to even just take their time coming into the season because there isn't the the bright lights of that the World Cup provide right right in their face off the line. so that's a uh, yeah it's exciting to see I'm, I'm keen to see how it continues to develop there as you said earlier there's only a handful of races left in the domestic season it seems like but uh yeah, we've got some interesting storylines. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, for, on paper, the schedule looks really good. It's going to be interesting to see how it plays out where, you know, not having that early World Cup, but then not having any World Cups at all. I, I, we were talking yeah. before we started recording that, you know, like I didn't go to really rad last year because we were already in Europe for like these early, earlier World Cups. We were like in, in I think it was uh, France and, and Dublin. Now it's not until Thanksgiving, until the the world cup season starts so it really just kind of changes everybody's i'm sure when they're you know in training peaks like plotting their uh their <laughs> their 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 schedule for the year and how they're gonna the periodization and all that kind of fun stuff that people like to nerd out about it's it's got to look a lot different this year than it has in the past it's good good for team budgets too because i think uh it's generally a little bit cheaper to fly to europe after thanksgiving when the weather is colder uh over there so i think it works out for all parties domestic on this uh this side of the pond at least yeah it turns out what i found which was uh, really good is that the airbnb market in belgium in the winter actually actually is pretty soft so uh <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. even better yeah the people the people who are going to cross races usually already live there so it's not a not a problem um but yeah so uh end of this race came down to magli and Katie Klaus, uh, I think Katie was pretty stoked on just being up there and being in the race. But yeah, let's listen to let's listen to her, her day one. Katie, um, first podium here mm-hmm. at Kings. Tell yeah. me, just just walk me through this race, how it went down. Yeah, I mean, we went, we started out really fast, which I feel like Lauren, Mags, and I have a pretty start fast already. So Mags hit it like the first few laps really hard, which made the separation. She was super strong today. Um, And it just happens like this course is so fast that it's like you can't really form too many gaps if you're like pretty evenly matched. So it was kind of hard to make gaps and like there's also a good amount of wind. So it's like sitting on the wheel was pretty like he just like float behind the wheel. So it was really it was a really fun race super fast and um just battled with mags and lauren was doing great today she um, was sitting with us so that was super cool but yeah at the end mags just put in like a really good dig at the last lap um and i was able to stay with her and i was like oh maybe i have it in the sprint like but it was just like i just needed like just this much more <laughs> yeah it sounded like you were you, you're using magley just over the season for how you're progressing yeah. from a couple weeks yeah. ago to now and it sounds yeah. like sounds like you're pretty happy with that progression yeah yeah i think i started off a little bit slower than i would like but it's a really long season i mean worlds is in february and um the more racing i do i feel like the more i progress so it's good are you thinking about nationals at all uh yes obviously i really would love to win nationals we'll see um my goal right now is Pan Ams, and then we're going to go to Dublin, so it's like a working progress. I think I'm excited for nationals to come, but I'm also excited for the races. Awesome. Well, congrats come. on the podium today. Thank we'll you. see you tomorrow. <laughs> First off, she uh, disproved my um, – it wasn't windy out there, so I guess I shouldn't I shouldn't discount that. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like it's when you're racing, it's so much more acute than if you're standing there. You're like, ah, oh, it's not bad. Maybe a nice breeze. It's cooling me down. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know. Uh, I'm sure at the speed that those uh, ladies are traveling to, it feels probably 10x what it does on the on the side of the course for sure. But I, I, you, when you asked, you said there in your interview that it was the first time on a podium at at Cincinnati, and I just I couldn't believe that that was the case. But look, I, I think like I'm not I'm not sure course. if that's true. I'll have it to is. go back and look. Oh, it is. It is. Yeah, I was oh, just okay. looking through the results and the what they have on Cyclocross 24 is Katie and the the U. 19 field or she was racing age u19 but in the elites and had not had not finished on on the podium i don't think uh just check myself here in real yeah. time but uh maybe one one second place but um well yeah, the funny in, in 2019 the funny thing with with folks like her and especially katie klaus because that you know the joke i used to always make is that she had more national champions than years alive um is that she's been doing this for so long and yet she's really not that old. Yeah. Like she, she's what only like a, this is only her second year in the elites, I think. Yes. Yeah. Still 23 years old. 
Yeah. Yeah. But I, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to steal like Bodie's thunder here, but just from the racing that we've seen so far. And that's kind of why I asked her about the, about nationals. Definitely, definitely looking like the, the favorite now, now that we know that Clara is, uh, onto, onto different things that, um, I think that, uh, somebody else is going to have to step up and, uh, and, and, and compete with her. But if I'm, if I'm picking somebody just, uh, from right now for us nationals, it's going to be Katie Klaus. It definitely seems like the women's field for nationals and even perhaps for Pan Ams. I'm not sure if, if Mags is planning to go or not, um, or the Holmgren sisters. Yeah, that's, that. that's, it's always, it's always the secret Canadians that get in there and, uh, and, and, and then mess, mess it up. up. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, for, for us nationals, um, I think that it seems like it's going to be a wide open field, you know, in your cast with Sven, Katie Compton. And then it, the, the era of Clara was happening. And now this year, Clara stepping back from racing and, focusing on school and uh so yeah i'm keen to see in in december who's uh who's going to take the the mantle up next and if we see a, another era of dominance from one rider yeah it's uh it, my my uh kind of like journal media side versus team side for me where i get hypocritical is i love um pressuring other people's riders into jumping up and racing um above their <laughs> age category and and going mm -hmm. in international so you know I, when we talk to lizzie in a bit uh, that's uh i put that towards her same thing with um ian ackert who had a really good uh race weekend who's u23 for pan ams trying to trying to get him to bump up to uh the uh the elites as well but, but they oh, have their great. own plans. They don't need me to to be pressuring them. Uh, final final one for the uh, women's podium on this day. Lauren Zerner, breakout ride for her. A really really strong ride to get. We'll want to to hang with Katie and Magley for the whole race. We know Lauren's like a super strong uh, starter, but it's just being able to maintain that for the for the duration of the race, and then uh, you know be a factor coming into that last lap but uh let's um let's listen to how uh Laur lauren's day went i really wanted to ride with magalie and katie for a full race for once um and th with the europeans being gone um it's a good opportunity to really like capitalize so you're sticking in their third wheel the whole time was that just was that the plan or did you want to try or you just felt comfortable there for today you know it's kind of hard to come up with a plan when i'm not sure where it's going to shake out um, with the leader of the race, like the like the lead of the race being a lot different than it has been all season, um, but definitely once I once we established that top three, I was like, I am not moving. I'm staying in third wheel. And then there were a couple laps in the middle. I was like, it's getting kind of easy. Like I could probably launch an attack from here, but I was like, no, like sit in and then see what happens. Like just just make it to where you can make it to and sit in for as long as possible and go with everything. And taking notes for tomorrow, it seemed like final lap going up just that um, up to the camel on the front half that Mag started to push up the pace. And then what happened back in the woods? Um, really just in that section between a couple like rolling bumps and then the corner into the off camber straight and then paved straight into the final woods section. Um, Mag's really had a strong push. Um, pretty much every lap she had a strong dig in there. Um, and I knew I was just a little off the pace in that small section. Um, so the last lap, that's really where, that's really where I got dropped off. Um, and then, I mean, I'm honestly like stoked to have just ridden it in, but tomorrow I'm definitely going to be more aware of where I can push the pace a little harder and where I need to, where I need to step it up. Awesome. Well, congrats and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for talking to me. <laughs> I love the touches on the, for the U23 Pan Am champ on the jersey. That's a, that's a cool look. And I think a lot of the U23 or junior champions and their various uh, competitions don't always get the, the opportunity to wear the jersey. So it's cool that she's got that on the sleeves. And yeah, I mean, just another rider that's had a steady progression over the years as looking at Cyclocross 24, just watching, trending up to the right. Yeah, and it's it was interesting too. It's the kind of thing that I think I think she played it right. She was like, "Yeah, I could have attacked, but you know, she's she's in a position that she hasn't been all year. So you you kind of you kind of have to figure out how to do that first, right? Before you're yeah. the before you're the instigator." Yeah, and it's cool to see these young racers 
I'd say develop, watch them develop that maturity of, of their race brain and their tactics and not just go and, uh, I, you know, at least in the men's field, it seems like all the U23 and junior racers go full tilt all the time. And uh, it's cool in that you start to see, well, it's cool, but also a, a little nerve wracking when you start to race tactically and then, you know, start beating up on, on all the old folks like, uh, like they did to me for a while. <laughs> Here, here's here's my um kind of pop culture or i i guess yeah yeah maybe pop culture no, but so a couple years ago we started to see a lot of in cycling a lot of people talk about the results in f1 terms like finishing p1 or p2 or p3 right right that oh. that's that kind of was a big thing in the drive yeah. to survive era what i'm hearing this a lot and it was from, it was even from like Aline Clausel, and now it's kind of infiltrating through the rest of the field. And maybe you can tell me, maybe this existed before, but it doesn't seem like it. The term push. Mm. There's a very, very like car, you know, pushing and lifting in, 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 yeah. in car racing seems to move over now. We get a lot of people, instead of like putting an acceleration or attacking, they're pushing. Yeah, I don't, I think that is a, uh, a cultural uh, moment that Drive to Survive influence, I should say, that Drive to Survive is having because I don't, yeah, I don't remember that term, but you know, yeah, maybe yeah. I'm just showing my age there, not keeping up with the lingo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So, um, in uh, I guess so, we talked to Rochette, Klaus, and Zerner. They were the top three. Carolyn Manny, uh, you know was fourth after she made that separation in after lap three. I think that's when uh, Lizzie went down. Uh, Rayla Nuss, fifth on the wide-angle podium on Saturday, and then just fo- followed up by, uh, by a crew of, of young riders again, Mia Azeltine, uh, Ella Brenneman, uh, Kaya Musgrave, Catherine Sarkisov and uh you know through nine and then you know finishing up on that top 10 with Anna McGailey yeah and it looks like uh a lot of the same in in day two was it was it the same a same outcome for the women well similar in the top two but was it a different race at all yeah it it, it sort of shake shook out a little differently so you know Lauren really never got the opportunity to uh figure out what to do next had a a couple different run-ins was on the ground a couple times so she didn't 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 have the race that she wanted so she wasn't up there on the uh opposite side of that uh lizzie gonzalez had a clean race was able to get out to the to the to the front early and get safe and be be in there be in there with uh with the leaders um and it, it, b- behind that uh you know a, a fun story that we had for our CXD Trek bikes squad is that uh Alyssa Sarkisov and uh Lily Sonneman both raced the junior race on Saturday uh Alyssa was one that I think uh, Lily was fourth and then this is this is how out of the loop I am. I go to the beginning of the junior elite races and I'm like, oh, it seems like our riders have scratched. They're not racing today. Maybe I should figure out what's going on. I went back there <laughs> after that race. They're just kind of chilled out in their in their kits and their tents. And I was like, I'm going to go on context clues that y'all are racing the elites. And they were like, <laughs> yes. I was like, okay, good to know. Uh, so they, they, um, they they jumped into the elite race and uh, yeah, Alyssa Sarksov just uh, had a great race right up there you know her si- older sister Catherine Sarkisov uh finished up in sixth place she's another one who's kind of like you know coming off a of road season getting into cross and just every week just a little bit better so that's it was fun to see uh both of them jump in I, I Sonneman ended up 16th on the day great top 20 result for her so just just seeing the juniors kind of take advantage of these c2 days and jump into the elites is, is pretty sweet yeah, it is really cool to see that I say the diverse ranges of of ages here just across this top 15, 16 uh, results. A lot of, like you said, a lot of teenagers coming up to potentially if you're looking for uh, some movers and shakers in the women's elite field, names to keep your eyes on. Yeah, and this one, you know, a little different story. I think we had a really exciting race on Saturday. It was still a fun one to watch. Uh, Mags was able to 
get away with a, a couple laps to go and kind of make that make that separation and she took the win uh solo on this day by 25 seconds kd uh still solidly in second place really didn't was was able to to separate herself from gonzalez actually rochette and and klaus uh both kind of were able to uh get rid of uh, lizzie uh with a couple laps to go she came in third place but again another one who's i think still coming coming into the season but really um you know good racing there but just not the not the same ending that we had on saturday i did get a chance to uh catch up with lizzie after this one so let's just see how her weekend went all right rough start yesterday but you got a redo today <laughs> talk to me about just the fast start and going out pretty much you know trying to get out the front early yeah i mean i knew today with the dust like sometimes just leading your own lines can feel a little bit more clean you're not breathing other people's dust literally and so I just kind of gauged how I was going to feel in the start and it turns out I had enough gas to really just lead and do my own pace and it really worked out in my favor today because I was really blocking out all of the noise that was around me and not really worrying about what was going on except for the race that I could I had a fresh course right in front of me so I just led and s like just just to see where it was going to lead me and it it shook out pretty well for me in the end uh it looked like you <clears throat> kind of made a move there maybe mags countered and then that that kind of um was when you when you fell back talk to me just about those last couple laps yeah so that was about i think three laps in i was sitting third wheel and there was a little bit of separation that happened right around this section right before the barriers and magali kicked and it was three laps in and she kicked really hard and from what i could see it was the last kick that she really had and i didn't have enough to match it but I know that if I did, that that would have been the separation and that, I mean, the gap between us didn't vary much at all for three laps. So it was a little heartbreaking to see in the moment, but I knew I had to just pick myself back up and realizing that I was still racing for the podium, that the race wasn't over at that point. And um, I just didn't give up today. Awesome. So next week uh, up in uh, really rad, just uh, feel like you're starting to get back into the groove, yeah? Yeah. I mean, I only had one rate, like cross weekend before this, and a lot of the other people I've been racing for the last month and a half. So I'm very happy with where I'm at, and I'm excited to go home and spend some quality time with my family and just feel feel relaxed and kind of on home turf, which would be nice. No pressure, but any 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 thoughts to racing elite at uh, nationals? As of now, I'm planning to race under 23. So, yeah, okay. we'll see. All yeah. right. There it is. Just trying to influence other teams' <laughs> riders to up, yeah. upgrade yeah. to the, the elite fields. That's it. That's my that's my plan. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's is super cool to hear again that that level of maturity and you know now being on the sidelines, watch some of these younger racers who were racing the junior or the U twenty three fields. Um, you know, it's cool just to hear Lizzie talk about how she had to pick herself up and was riding at the front just so that she could have a clear shot at it um and yeah developing as a racer and, and coming on strong so you know maybe uh maybe she has a good weekend at really rad and your influence can grow stronger bill in terms of getting to the race elite we'll see we'll see what happens but yeah no it, and it's a uh, I, I do i also like the the there's a confidence in there that I think you see from these riders as she's like, yeah, if I would have gone there, I, I could have stuck for the rest of the race. And I think that's, that's really, really healthy, uh, you know, for, for being able to compete at that level, you know, always, yeah. always look at what you can improve on and, but, uh, feeling, feeling like you did a good job on the day. Uh, all right. Um, anything else you're seeing there and there was results for the, for the, I think we've, I think we've said it all, you know, some, some riders like Rochette, trending in the right direction katie klaus trending in the right direction everybody seems to be making moves on the on the women's elite side to to improve so uh, hopefully this is all building towards um fantastic you know end of the season races um not just that really rad but also yeah i think you know especially it's never too early to start prognosticating about <laughs> nationals you know we talked about katie Klaus, uh, after that, pretty wide open. It's going to be yeah. really interesting to see what happens. Most definitely. Most definitely. Next, yeah, I'll, hold my, 
Yeah, I think Really oh, Rad's going to be interesting, and then uh, Pan Am's also, for, for those who make the trip to Montana. Uh, let's move on over to the to these men's races. Um, so we had Eric Bruner back. He, he let, We last saw him, Charm City, had some good battles with Scott Funston and Andrew Strohmeyer. I think those were the three riders we were really looking at. You know, Curtis still coming on at that that point as well but i think it was it was really uh funston and strohmeyer and bruner who were uh, showing themselves to be the top three came into cincy and just bruner uh no strohmeyer no funston so i think we're gonna have to wait till really rad until we get everybody back under the same racing roof but uh good to see bruner out there and just uh really an interesting dynamic with how he's racing right now and then also with some Canadians that showed that they were really fast at Major Taylor coming down to Cincy and and picking up where they left off in these races. Yeah, it seems like the uh, Canadian cyclocross cadre after uh, last week and Major Taylor racing racing like a like a unit there it, in terms of day one, Kelp, three through five. And uh, with Gunner, you know, in in seventh, not too far back. So it's always cool to see, especially these younger group, these younger Canadian riders come down and uh, just provide a gentle reminder that they have, they have some fast bike racers up there. Uh, yeah, and this was the first first I think of the year. I don't think who's that major show of, uh, uh, of our uh, Pan Ams from last year. Who's that guy, Evan Russell? <laughs> Shown. <laughs> Showing up and making his uh, presence known near the near the uh, front as well. Yeah, yeah, finishing up in in ninth. And um, I'm curious: is this a uh, is is Bruner v. Strohmeyer? Is that the new Wout v. Matthew where they avoid each other? They go on opposite weekends until the the final showdown. We only gotta, get a glimpse of it times per year. You got to build up that that tension and that narrative. You know, that's that's what we're doing right now. Yeah, I think I think you're right. They're each doing their own. Uh, their own program and then that's just gonna that makes it so you don't know you really don't know you haven't you don't have that that head-to-head yet uh but um yeah so day one uh bruner was kind of caught in the field there for a little while we had uh ian ackert who is just the fastest starter it seemed both days he was out there just uh leading the charge and just just getting at it early um he disappeared, I think, after, I think it was the third lap. It, again, it was coming into those, that the same section that Mag said that she slipped out. I think that's where uh, Ian went down. So that sort of dropped him out of contention. But he was he was definitely flying early. And that left it to uh, Bruner and, and Curtis and then Tyler Clark, I think, was, you know, there was a, a, a bit of a group there as as well um bruner used the starting straight you know that climb on the starting straight to to make his attack um i think tyler may have tried to shut it down first curtis went with him curtis was actually the one and i think this was a really good sign for curtis was able to get back to eric and stick with him you know, on the next lap, you know, Bruner's pace just kind of uh, was able to to gap Curtis. But just, just being able to make that effort and get up there was something that we hadn't seen from Curtis in, in previous weeks. Yeah, and another, you know, kind of similar to Magali, right? Curtis dealing with some early season pneumonia and coming back. And I'm sure his results have not been where he is accustomed to, to having them, especially after the years he's had it starting off hot at go cross and having some good results early on um and yeah to have to use all of his years of racing tactical nows to keep himself up at the front it seems like uh you know hopefully his his health is improving week by week and yeah he's he's proving that uh maybe he's trending in the right direction coming into form in the second half of the season yeah i i, I chatted with curtis after day one i think we mostly got to talking about what you were just saying which would be good listen to him and i think then 
um, my timing on uh, interview versus podiums kind of got in the way. And then uh, Mia Asselstein was on the U23 women's podium in a shark suit. And I think that that, that kind of took all of uh, Curtis's attention away from uh, to what, what we were talking about. But uh, let's, uh, Recording? let's, let's yes. listen okay. to that. Okay, Curtis, uh, welcome back to Cyclocross. How's it feel? <laughs> uh, it feels good to be seen. Uh, it's good to be back near the front. Um, yeah, it's definitely been a really challenging season up to this point. I, uh, everything up through July was going according to plan and I was happy with it. And then, um, I, I, again, I had, I have no idea how I ended up getting pneumonia in August. I don't think I've ever met anyone under 50 that got it, but, uh, it, it kicked my ass. Um, four weeks off the bike going into the season was not good prep and to have the consistency to keep pushing after each race effort to keep recovering after each effort and just expecting a little bit of myself every day um you know and then to the point where i mean not everyone's here but still a podium at a c1 and to be that close to eric on this course is something to be proud of yeah for sure and i know like you know publicly social media whatever else you're keeping it pretty positive about that every every week is a you're getting better but just from being at all these races you could see the frustration out there so it is it is it nice to sort of get beyond a little bit of that yeah i mean it, it's <laughs> to be honest i can't remember i mean it's I, i've always been at the forefront of these races and have had you know matches to burn and you know it, it, sometimes i've raced a little uh you know maybe reckless at times because I, i've had the the bandwidth and the power to do so um, just to take risks and then to be in a position this year where I had to pull every uh, trick up my sleeve just to hold the group and to be in the second group. So, you know, every day, again, just trying to stay positive and uh, trusting that, you know, I'm recovering from these efforts and then uh, to be in this position today was good. So I was happy with it. Anything different for tomorrow? Uh, I, I When Eric went, I was able to close a bit of a gap to get onto his wheel and hold it, uh, hold, hold his wheel for... An entire lap i just need to the the one real power sections uh from the base of the the start finish pavement section all the way to the top of the course so if i can hold his wheel for those sections and just follow in the wheels i'm a little distracted by what is this a, a shark going on the podium now who is this i don't know but i have to go take his photo with them right, so yeah, finish yeah. up go do, go do your job bill <laughs> i was distracted by how good that that all white kit looks uh little controversial i'm sure to go white white shorts but you know i i appreciate it i appreciate it's, the fashion risk it's uh it's yeah it's it's sending a message for sure it's um but yeah no they did a nice job on that but yeah it's it's i'll tell you the one thing uh you know where he is when you're looking out yeah. there on on the course you know you know where the steve tilford racers are yeah no longer just a sea of blue you've got some purple and a dot of white <laughs> out there as well so um, yeah. I, one thing that I thought was interesting, and, and maybe this is kind of a, the arc of the, the season, the storyline through the season, is everybody looking to either Strohmeyer or to Bitter as sort of the measuring stick. I think over the years you've seen Powers and then Hyde, and everybody's kind of comparing themselves to the, who's ever at the top. And now we have, you know, these two guys who everybody is basically mentioning, that, oh, they're not here this week, but, you know, I'm happy to, to get do X, Y, and Z. Um, and then having that measuring stick kind of constantly change, I think, is interesting uh, race to race. And, and yeah, um, no, for sure. So, uh, but yeah, like, talking about Bruner, let's um, let's listen to see how his day went on day one. A pretty good day today, huh? Yeah, it was. Uh, haven't been here in a while, but it's probably the UCI race I've done the most. I really enjoy it. It was my first C1 win, also a couple years ago. So, good to be back. <laughs> It's like you came back home. Uh, walk us through this race a little bit today. You haven't been racing too much cyclocross yet this season. Big field today. What was your strategy heading into the day? No, I've been taking it a little slower, just trying to save it for the end of the season. And I think I generally do better racing a little less, training a little more. Um, but a little hard to know how I was going to do today still. Um, I was more confident after Baltimore. But, yeah, still getting going here. Love it. And about halfway through the race, I think it was actually on lap four, you turned in by far the fastest lap time of the day. Was that a strategy? Did you think I'm going to attack and go, or were you holding back a little bit? 
No, I was all in there. Um, this course is really twisty, turny. There's only really one long pedaling section. And so I knew it wasn't going to be, even if I got away, it wasn't going to be immediately. I was going to have to attack for a long time. And really, it was well over a lap that I was attacking. Yeah, it was a tough one. And then take us through that last lap out there. Uh, Curtis White coming back a little bit. Were you keeping your eye on Curtis? Were you worried about that at all? Yeah, I was totally watching him. I maybe got a little complacent there. And just haven't spent a lot of time at sea level yet, so I you know, have to mentally re readjust to how hard I can go. So I was maybe a little complacent there. I was also riding file treads, and I know he was on Grifos. I probably would have switched to Grifos had I had a bigger gap. Um, so maybe that's something for tomorrow. It's getting pretty dusty, and I think we were pretty similar on the, on the tight corners, but as I got tired, it was easy to just lose fractions of a second uh, in the woods. All right, so... Here's the first thing I need to ask you, just listening to that interview. How much sympathy do you have for Eric Bruner and people in his situation who have to deal with training at altitude and then coming down and trying to adjust to racing at sea level? You know, as um, someone who never had the depth of, of power that, uh, you know, Eric Bruner does, it's hard for me to sympathize with somebody that has to readjust to how hard he can go. Um, you know, what does he get a 30 watt bump now in, in his FTP coming down to the sea level with the rest of us. So yeah, it's, it's hard for me to sympathize, um, you know, with the upper echelons of that, but you know, I'm glad that figured out he can go a little bit harder and, uh, yeah, I guess watch out everybody else. Eric's not at altitude anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, not not you know not much um, really from him to to report on 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 that one. I just I, I just think it's conf confirmation that he is he's Derek Bruner that we've seen every other year. You know, he's still going to come in here strong. He's still going to be the guy that um you you have to worry about. I mean, he's just he's just such a super strong racer and especially yeah. especially as as curtis was saying you get these sections where he's able to lay down some power and it's kind of like lights out yeah he is who we thought he was i guess <laughs> yeah final guy on the uh, podium for day one tyler clark caught up with him as well as so us yeah his day one All right. who are you? tyler Patrick's pretty good. third place but I don't know. It was, it was kind of all together, and then I think with four laps, Eric went, and then what was what was it like past that? After, like when he went, he went on the on the pavement. We all kind of just sat up, and I was just like, "Oh man!" So it was just all out as hard as I could go for like three quarters of the lap, and just coming out of like the forest section, it's a little bit of a grind uphill, and he just put it into me a bit, and I was off the back, and I was like, "I don't know." At this point, do I just like? Try and conserve, let these guys catch, and then Curtis came off on the start finish straight, and I caught up to him, and I was like, okay, the two of us can work together and see how far we can make it. So y'all, it looked like y'all did work together for a while, but then it kind of what what happened between you and Curtis? Yeah, we would uh, like trade pulls, like each of us do a lap in the front. You can recover a little bit on the wheel, um, and I was kind of hoping we go one more lap like that. But when it was his turn, he hit it, and then it was just like survival from there on, see how far I could make it. Um, I thought maybe if I could hold on to the la to the last lap, like get ahead of him some of the technical sections and make it to the barriers before but he was, he was just too strong so a couple weekends here with uh on the podium third places what do you what do you do tomorrow is it is there any uh, any secret attacks in there early on are you going to try to drive this race i don't know it's a hard course because you actually you can ride from the front pretty well like it's because it's not super windy it's gonna be hard it's, it's just gonna be like make sure i'm a little bit fresher by the time brunner goes and see if i can stay with him a little bit longer how are you feeling though, just like fitness-wise? I know you got like uh, Pan Ams as a goal coming up and Nationals. How, how are you feeling these days? Actually, really good. Like uh, last couple races, I've just gone out and just like I'm gonna stay at the front of the race, see how long I can make it, and legs seem to come around. And each race, it's like I can make another lap longer. And, and today was almost to the end, so I'm happy with that. So like feeling good. Awesome. Congrats, man. Thanks. I have a I have a question for you, Bill. Um, I I obviously chatted with Tyler Clark enough, but I'm kind of wondering if I was actually chatting with Owen Clark some of those times. I mean, I know they're brothers, but do they look eerily similar? Because it seemed like day one and day two, they were playing, you know, Bash Brothers tactics here on the rest. If you see them side by side, they're, they're definitely different people. However, and you know, they, and they, they, they kind of tease you into 
being able to tell the apart because you know the armada kits or like the hockey jerseys and they have mm-hmm. their names but the thing is you know in hockey normally if you have brothers on the team you'll put that first initial on the jersey as well right so yeah. but there's no like T and O Clark. It's just Clark and Clark. So I walked up. They're both standing next to each other. And I was like, because I needed to talk to Tyler. And I'm like, oh, man. And I even said, I was like, I I can't tell you apart. And Owens gives me a hard time. He's like, yes, you can. You need to talk to him. I was like, okay. <laughs> and it was bad, too, for me. I felt even worse because I had just talked to Tyler like two days before on Zoom for, you know, his uh, major Tyler as well. But but good question. Yeah. No, I, I yeah. think they look more similar than they'll they'll admit. It could be it could be a, a mix up in the Airbnb laundry pile, you know? You yeah. just you grab the wrong skin suit and all of a sudden people think it's Owen off the front, but it turns out it's Tyler. Who knows? Yeah. So it's it's cool to see again. Just I think the theme of my feedback of this race is just cool to see some some young talents that maybe we don't haven't always kind of cued in on before. Um I'm sure folks who are keenly following the North American cyclocross scene know about Tyler and Owen and their success at the, the nationals. It's cool to see them showing up to a, a race like Cincinnati and yeah, putting on a show. Yeah. And, and I do like, and I, and you just said it there, what I, what I like because we have such strong Canadian racers and we do, you know, see them down here all the time. And it's kind of all the, all of the same com- community community. You know, just referring to it as like North American cyclocross, which is what I always try to do because it really incorporates them as well. They don't have as many races up there. I think they have one C2 that comes the day after their nationals. And that's that's kind of it for UCI racing in Canada. Would love would love to see more. Um, yep. I would love, to, you know, for us to have the opportunity to to travel to some races, you know, early season races in, in Canada. Uh, but yeah, just just having that contingent down here is is always awesome which you know even 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 more came down i know probably rochester is the easiest race for everyone to get to so it's it's normally a big big crowd there but yeah seeing the seeing the regulars down here is always great um yeah day day two kind of kind of looking similar than uh than than as as day day one did um and where's the yeah again my getting my results mixed up here here's 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 my good uh prep for this i'm looking at it and i i downloaded uh saturday's results twice i'm like hey, it's exactly the same what happened on sunday <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it looks I, it's easy to do because you know saturday um spoiler alert don't want to steal your your thunder here bill but you know eric bruner at the top um ian acker looks like he bounced back and had a had a much better race uh only 17 seconds off the podium. So I'm not sure if Eric uh, remembered that he could go a little bit harder or if he was just, you know, dialing it back. Um, yeah, cool to see cool to see Ian up there. And close, looks like he was pretty pretty close overall. Yeah, I actually, that, that's a good lead into to, uh, my interview that I have with Ian, Ian. And what you just looked at on paper is exactly what we saw in in the race if you look at the lap times ian's with him with uh bruner the whole race he actually started fast was kind of dictating this race for uh, a lot of it and in that final lap it just looks like well the race was one lap too long for for ian acker obviously he just wasn't able to to stay with him in that last lap i mean he you know shed 20 seconds on on the final on the final lap uh Turns out he couldn't shift uh, for that last uh, half a lap. So no, yeah, he was doing a lot of spinning coming coming oh, into the man. finish. That's got to be, especially with a guy you know, like we talked about and with about day one, Curtis White coming into form, uh, getting better race by race, and then yeah, I'm sure if, if Ian couldn't shift and watching the the great white shark coming up behind you, that's got to be a little. I'd be sweating for sure if I wasn't already from the yeah, but Ian, uh, you know, coming in, coming in flying during the season, and I think he's he's wants to really try to dictate these races, and was really looking forward to to racing against Bruner. He's somebody that just wants to test himself against 
against the best guys out there. But uh, yeah, let's uh, let's take a listen to how his day went. Okay, Ian, um, another fast start, but you were able to kind of stay upright today. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but it looked like you know really good battle between you and Bruner. Just just tell me, you know, just just the beginning of that race and just your efforts in the beginning. Yeah, I mean, off the gun, I knew. Well, I didn't pre-ride. They changed the course a little bit for day two. So I knew I wanted to take the whole shot just in case there was any chaos in the first couple corners. Um, but I knew I wanted to make it hard from the beginning because yesterday there was a bit of group racing and I just didn't really want that. I wanted to have it strung out, have some good battles with, um, I mean, I really wanted to go head to head with Bruner and that's what we did. So I was pretty happy to do that, but yeah. It seemed like, yeah, you were able, especially on the starting stretch, you know, that's where he was strongest, but you were able to counter a lot of the time, even I think with like two or three to go, you were able to, to go out in front. But it seemed just from watching from the outside, maybe maybe just one lap too many. Yeah, um, he was able to get a little gap uh, going, I think, into the barriers, going on to the last lap. There's a little bit of room. Um, I almost closed it. And then going into the woods, my shifter actually died or the battery, something happened with my shifter and I couldn't shift any harder. So I knew at that point it was over. But yeah, going like match for match, uh, I was throwing some attacks, he was throwing some attacks. I, I, maybe I surprised him a little bit by staying with him for so long. Um, I just knew I wanted to keep the pace high. So. Okay, so that's 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 good to know. So fitness was there for the whole time. I saw you like pointing to your to the rear of your bike when you came over the line. So that's what that that was going yeah, on. Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. All right, well, that, I mean that that stinks that you had a mechanical there, but at least I mean you got to feel good about about the effort and where where oh, you yeah. are. Oh yeah, for sure. This was like a, a little warm up, um, just to get the cross legs going. Uh, I'm going to Pan Ams and Nationals, so I would like to try and defend there uh, from last year. So I kind of just needed a little warm up before that. So you, twenty three for Pan Ams? Yeah, and Nationals. Yeah. So you don't want, you don't want to do like, you don't want to jump in there. I would one more year though. Okay. One more year. I'm yeah. just pressuring you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, man. More. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, Fields got to worry when Ian Ackert steps up because I mean, it seems like his confidence. Not that it what shouldn't. He has he has plenty of reason to be very confident, but to hear him talk about how he's surprising Bruner by throwing his own attacks. Uh, world's got to look out when he uh, when he finally gets one in the bag. Uh, Ian Bruner or whoever else he's uh, kind of measuring himself. Yeah, no, I, I, he looks really strong. It's gonna be fun to watch him in Pan Ams again. It's completely selfish on my part. I just want to see all of these guys racing in in the in the elites. Uh, but also, it's it's something that you know. I know you've probably uh, done also when you were racing in elite championship races you see these like really strong younger kids and you're like oh sweet don't have to race against them this week because they're not in the same age category man yeah every time that it was the the elite nationals or elite pan ams the field was much smaller uh everything was a little more chill because we didn't have such youthful exuberance in the field um yeah did, not the same for the rest of the year but um no it's always good to see see some some young up and coming talents and watch them kind of develop and even if that means that they're passing some of the older riders it's for this the strength and and future of north american cyclocross it's cool cool to see and yeah ian's ian's a talented talented rider um in the junior and, and now seeing him step up to u23 it's yeah i think uh things. yeah I think for for this day, looking at the results here, you know, we were joking about Owen and and Tyler Clark. I believe Tyler was up there battling with Curtis for that third place and had to get had to take a bike. I think on the final lap, so that's why he dropped down, and then uh, Owen was able to to pass him, get ahead of him, and I'm sure he, uh, Owen probably didn't let Tyler hear the end of it. <laughs> Well, you got to have the clean bike for the the pictures, you know. Um, that's that's part of it sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Especially with all that dust out there. I did catch up with Curtis on day two as well. So let's. Uh, I think we made it through the whole interview this time. So let's listen to Curtis. Third place day two as well. Yeah. 
Just uh, it didn't it didn't look like it was happening at first. It looks like you were stuck in uh, like fifth place for a while when it was mm -hmm. coming down to it. How did it all play out? Yeah, it was a really fast start. Ian Ackert hit out pretty quickly and set a good pace um, and just lined the race out. I didn't have the best start and was kind of on the back foot for a while um, and tried to make up space when we could. Really that, you know, fourth to eighth position is just a washing machine. So everyone's just making chops, trying to make passes. And I tried to time my passes to the best moment. Um, Bruner and Ian were on a good level today and just kept pushing it. And I was in the group at the end with uh, the two Clark brothers. So it was just a good old fashioned Canadian sandwich. So yeah, it ended up well. Yeah, no, it was uh, Tyler Clark ended up going into pits with a lap and a half to go. I think he started to have like a rear flat. So that's, and cross, that's the time to punch it. Um, and then the other, what's it, it's Tyler and- Owen. Owen, Owen Clark, yeah. And then he and I just duked it out the last lap. So I just tried to hold him off. Nice, so overall, good weekend. I feel like uh, moving forward, progressing. Moving forward, consistent weekend, uh, really rad next. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the progression. Awesome, thanks. That away for, yeah, Curtis, uh, trend, like I said, trending upwards. He'll be back in his own bed, I'm sure. Well, I don't know how it's maybe a too far of a drive to sleep up in, I think he's up in the, the North shore area of Massachusetts and then drive down to Falmouth, but you know, some good home cooking and just hanging out at home. I'm sure we'll do him good and teeing us up for a, another good race. Yeah, for sure. I think that's going to be a really fun weekend to, to see how it all plays out and just kind of leading into pan ams and then you know the the one thing that i do want to mention because i think we may have had some wrong information or just kind of um uh yeah weren't sure what's going on but just got the word this morning hendersonville is happening uh which is really great to hear one great to hear that they're able to to function as a community after after the hurricane and flood damage to to get back to a point where you know, make it, being able to have this race and, and do these things. So that's really good to hear. And if you are one of these racers out here who didn't think that race is going on, uh, it is, and it'd be awesome to go down there and, and race in Hendersonville and, and support that community. So still time to register for that one. Yeah. And always a great course, you know, hopefully it's good to hear that that race is still happening, especially after Helene going through there and just wreaking havoc on the Western North Carolina area, but always a another fun course, a good balance of power and technical skill required to race there. So it's, um, yeah, it's exciting um, here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And as I said, next weekend, really rad. We did have some European action that happened. Tyler, I know you were able to see these races. I actually was like either at races or driving from Ohio back to DC and didn't, didn't really catch up. So, uh, you know, just briefly, let me know, let me know what your standout performance is or just kind of highlights from the, from the weekend. Yeah. I mean, Saturday was, uh, another round of the exact cross series, um, with, and with the super prestige kicking off on Sunday, I think the fields were a little lighter, but, um, on the women's side, Marion Norbert Reberol, um, had a, a super strong attack about around the halfway point, just one of those attacks where I'm pretty sure she was in the 10 or 11 tooth and the back wheel was just skipping all over the place. That's how much power she was putting down. And um, her teammate kind of did the the teammate card, Sarah Casasola in the, in the chase group, letting her Don shot and Frank try to try to reel Marion in and then ended up second. So a nice one too for them. But uh, the, in terms of the the race at Essen, the, the men's race was, one to watch with uh this this weekend was back in full effect with lauren's um doing it in the sprint um another standout performance from Niels van de Putte. and um he actually just made one mistake and looked like he wasn't in the last corner wasn't quite in his pedals because as they're coming onto the pavement you see you know lauren's second wheel he launches and Niels has this half second where it's like is my foot in the pedal or is it not? And once he got that confirmation, he started going, but didn't have enough uh, runway there to pull him back in. So another good race there. Um, another last, if you haven't watched it, the last lap, uh, it's out there on YouTube, I think, to watch 
Jens Adams using Tune Ertz as a as a um a what do you call it? The cushy barriers, the inflatable barriers, um, human inflatable barrier tune arts uh in the last lap. That was kind of fun to see. No disqualifications though. So they kept their cool, you know, racing incident there. But um yeah, in terms of races to watch from the last weekend, if you if you were driving or you were at Cincy and didn't have time to catch it, the women's elite race at Rudervorda, man, that was such a cool race to watch um, with uh, Celine Del Carmen Alvarado pulling out the victory. But it wasn't until maybe the last lap and a half or two laps uh, where they caught up to Lucinda. It was uh, Celine Femme, and I think Casa Sola was in that chase group, and they caught up to Lucinda. And then it really came down to, you know, Rudervorda has that uphill sand section that. No one was acing in, in either field, but um, having, we were talking about Cincy being a, a hard course to pass on. Um, Celine had the front there, which she got off, which forced Lucinda to then also get off her bike. Um, but actually, Celine slid out through that next, you know, turn down and then another 180 at the bottom. Celine just lost the front wheel. Uh, but because she had the front and it was a tight corner, was able to slow Lucinda down and uh, still maintain the lead. But yeah, it's still a a great last lap Um, and one for the, yeah, one for the super prestige, which I can't remember if that's time or points um, that series. I think super prestige is the time one. Okay. I believe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No one can comment and tell us we're wrong. Oh yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Uh, That, that, that root of order course is like, one of my favorites it's the one it's the one that it, it is basically if you talk to me at a race about european racing it's the one i will always tell you about because it's the one that was a just a flat field a sheep's field yep. you know that they just yep. the the construction company family who wanted to have a cyclocross race just built that thing they you know yeah. from ground up and put all that really cool you know just got their heavy machinery out there, brought in all that dirt, built those mounds, built that run up, built that huge sand uphill sand section. And it's just insane that it's just sitting there. And it's for all the people that are like, well, we don't have the same topography that they have in Belgium. It's like, we do. You just need heavy equipment. And then you too can have that. You just need some random dirt piles that you grow grass on for a year. And then you just route your course up and down and across them because yeah, that course, um, it is kind of funny. I, was fortunate to do it one time, but you're feel like you're racing through someone's backyard because um, that's kind of what it seems like. As you, you are, I, I mean, you are though. It's like the schools right there, the playgrounds yep. right there, and that's you know. <laughs> but you see that a lot. But I just love that they. You look at all the fields around them, and they're just like pancake flat. And then all of a sudden, here are these hills. You know, like so. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's it's not yeah. it's not natural. No. Uh, yeah. I and then just uh, Alvarado. I I saw it at Berenson last week. It's just I think. She, you know, hopefully she stay, stays healthy and just she looks like she's on one this year, which will be really fun to watch. Yeah, I know she had, you know, last year it was pretty emotional. I think she won. Did she win the Super Prestige or the World Cup overall? I think. It, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Major titles. And I know that she's I remember just seeing how, uh, you know, excited she was about about winning that. And I know she had a couple, rough couple of years after World Championships victory. So. Yeah, I guess it, it's cool to see her come back and, and have some success. And, you know, Fem looks good, looks good, but it's cool to see that she's not running away with every every race that she enters. Either. Yeah, for sure. Well, Tyler, thank you so much for uh, stepping in here. It's always awesome to catch up with you and have your, uh, even even though you may not be racing, I love that you are still, still still have your nose in the game and and, and can bring that uh, kind of insights to, to what we're talking about. Yeah, thanks for having me, Bill. It's always always good to still listen to, to you guys' breakdowns every week and yeah, just uh, love talking about cycling still. <laughs>